Okay, thanks for everyone for joining. This is Sam of Historian Splaining. A historian tells you why everything you know is wrong. This is my first video lecture, and we are doing it live. So please forgive any technical hiccups or snafus. My wonderful new producer, Dan Rogers, is in the stream as well. So he is orchestrating this all from behind the scenes and making it possible. But what I'm going to try to do is give a lecture spanning the development, the evolution, the different styles of Western architecture right from ancient Egypt up through the Roman era and into the early Middle Ages. It should be in five parts. And I'm going to have uh, my slides on full screen most of the time, so I'm not going to be seeing the stream all the time, but I'll check back at the end of each section. If people have questions, please put them in the YouTube chat, and Dan will highlight them, and hopefully I'll have time to talk about them. Okay, so uh, can you, so Dan, can you make the, great, okay, so I'm seeing what you are seeing. I'm just in the corner here. So I want to talk about this long stream and evolution of Western architecture. And I'm going to try to first put forward a set of a few themes, or what I call axes of variation, that you can see different styles and designs shifting among. And so I want to explain what those are first. So the first one that I always like to emphasize is the variation between verticalism and horizontalism. Does the line and direction of your building point upward towards the sky, or does it reach outward across the earth? Linearity versus roundness. Does your building or your structure have a forward-looking direction, or does it face inward towards a focal point? And finally, plainness and simplicity versus richness and ornamentation. So that's pretty self-explanatory. So just to illustrate what I'm talking about, verticalism versus horizontalism. So over here on the left, this is the Duomo of Milan, and it's a Gothic building. It's a pretty dramatic example of verticalism, right? Everything about it points upward, draws the eye upward. It's reaching up towards the sky, towards the heavens, almost as if it's about to lift off, right? And verticalist buildings like this are made to tower over the landscape, right? And to, to catch the eye. Over here, this is, some of you might recognize, this is the famous house Falling Water designed by Frank Lloyd Wright, a house in Pennsylvania. And all of Frank Lloyd Wright's buildings really are horizontalist, right? And his, his signature style is called the prairie style, right? It's supposed to look open, spacious. It's supposed to look like it's reaching out through the landscape in harmony, embracing the landscape. So these are different philosophies, right, and approaches to making a beautiful, dramatic, interesting building. But it's important to note here, of course, this is not the same as simply saying, is your building tall or short, right? If you look at these two buildings, both of them are about as tall as they are wide. That's not what it's about. It's about how is it structured and what kind of lines and directions are emphasized. So different styles through the ages shift back and forth between verticalism and horizontalism and in between. Then there's linearity versus centrality, right? So on the left here, this is the long gallery of Hever Castle in Kent in England, which was built in the Tudor period in the 1500s. And you can see how it's built to dramatically draw the eye and draw the visitor forward through space towards some destination. And there are all these repeating horizontal lines, the coffering, the ceiling, the floorboards. Everything is sort of drawing you and moving you forward from from front to back, right? And here this, this end point is this window, which probably has a dramatic view. Then there's centrality. Over here on the right, this is the Church of the Holy Sepulchre in Jerusalem. And you can see it's a rotunda, these colonnades circling, almost like uh, pilgrims or worshipers circling, walking around this single central focal point, which is the shrine in the middle placed over the supposed site of Jesus's tomb. Right, So everything about this church is supposed to draw you inward towards that central focal point. It's an inward-looking building. 
So these are two different ways of approaching a building and guiding people in it and through it. And again, different styles move back and forth between these two poles. And then thirdly, this is pretty obvious, plainness versus ornamentation, right? So this is the Romanesque chapel in the Tower of London, uh, which is simple, dignified, austere, peaceful. It's appropriate as a place of prayer in the tower, which is a military building, right? Very austere. And this you might recognize is the Hall of Mirrors at the Palace of Versailles, which is a Baroque masterpiece, which is intended to be dazzling, right? With rich ornamentation. And both of these are ways to make a, an impression, right? And to inspire different emotions in the viewer. The, the simplicity and austerity or the richness and complexity. So just having pointed those out, I'll just quickly check and make sure everything is working right. Everyone can see in here, no problems. Okay, great. So with those different themes and axes of variation in mind, let's say, where does the story start? So there's really no single beginning point, but I'm gonna choose to start in ancient Egypt with the pyramids. So probably all of you recognize this is the Great Pyramid at Giza. So it's world famous. It's one of the wonders of the world. The pyramidal design is supremely simple and austere, right? No ornamentation. The original building was completely covered over in this limestone facing. So it is smooth, almost featureless. It is grand, dignified, simple, symmetrical. It draws the eye inward and upward to the single focal point of the peak. And it is pure monumentalism, right? There's, there's no real entry point. There's no feature that draws anyone into it. And in fact, there are chambers, there are tombs and worship uh, temple chambers inside, but those would have been sealed off, right? They're basically invisible. Many of them are hidden. Only a tiny elite of priests ever would have gone in there, right? So this is not a structure that draws people in to interact with it. It just towers over the landscape, almost like an artificial mountain, right? So this is just pure monumentalism. And the story that the evolution of architecture really begins around 2000 BC with a new kind of landmark building. And that is the temple of Mentuhotep II, which was built around 2000 BC or a little after. And you can see here it is pyramid-like, right? It stacks up towards the central peak. Uh, the slopes all point towards that central peak. It's plain, austere stone. But it's as if the builders have kind of reached into the pyramid and kind of torn it open. So now it has these wide, inviting openings, right? So these are porticos, simple porches where the roof is extended outward and supported by these simple repeating columns in a colonnade. And it can it looks uh, more open, more inviting. There's this gently sloping ramp, which invites the viewer or the visitor to go up and enter into the building. It is much more horizontalist, right? Instead of perfect sl sloping lines that are sort of balanced between horizontal and vertical, instead you get these long, open-looking horizontal lines sort of spreading out across the landscape, opening outward. And this temple was built really just at the end of the first great era of monumental building in ancient Egypt. And after Mentuhotep II, there was a long abeyance where for several hundred years, for whatever reason, monumental building stopped. And it was revived again several hundred years later by the Pharaoh Hatshepsut, who was a very successful long reigning female Pharaoh in the 1400s BC. And she looked back to Mentuhotep II and then pushed that design further, more dramatically. So this is just a simple forward view of her mortuary temple complex in Egypt. And you can see it's now, the colonnade has opened up even wider. There are now three terraces that you can see and look into. There are two gently sloping ramps. And it seems that this temple complex was designed to receive processions. So great festal processions would come on boats up the Nile. They would dock. Uh, 
people would disembark and then they would march up a processional pathway to the temple complex with offerings, gifts. They would hold ceremonies and feasts inside the temple. And this is a view from above and you can see the, the, the colonnades reach out wide. They can look, the and the repeating columns are evocative, you could say, of a grove of trees or trees maybe in a garden. And in fact, Hatshepsut was a great lover of gardens. She sponsored uh, voyages to neighboring countries to bring back plant specimens. And these areas with sort of ruined uh, channels and ditches were probably irrigated gardens. So you would have had lush trees, palm trees, gardens along this festal procession, sort of welcoming the visitors in. And when you look at the whole complex, some of the walls have collapsed, but you can see how it's almost like arms reaching out wide, right? Uh, embracing the viewer and the visitor, drawing them in. It is not at all forbidding, or at least in, in my estimation, it's not forbidding like a monolithic pyramid, right? It's a whole different kind of building and monument that hadn't been done before. And furthermore, you can see it sort of fits modestly into the landscape, although it's wide and open and grand and impressive. It's really quite modest, situated against these massive cliffs. And there's even this interesting echo. So if you go up the upper ramp towards the top terrace, you can see the double row of pillars. And then there are some surviving statues of the Pharaoh in front of the pillars. And look at how the pillars and the statues echo the crags and outcroppings of the cliffs above them. It's almost like a subtle uh, echoing of the landscape around it. So this is, this is a grand building. It's impressive, but it has all these qualities of a, a supremely horizontalist building, right? Openness, breadth, and modesty, closeness to the landscape. So this temple complex of Hatshepsut then became one of the big foundational inspirations then for Greek architecture. And I won't get into a whole lot of Greek temples, except, of course, to discuss the Parthenon, which is the grandest, the most defining Greek temple. So if you compare the Parthenon to what we just saw with the temple of Hatshepsut, there are clear parallels and similarities, right? These long, broad colonnades, these long, sweeping horizontal lines. And there are, but there are key differences too at the same time, right? The pillars in proportion to the width, especially when you look at this front portico, it's taller and it has this peaked entablature, right? With a high gabled roof. So it actually is more vertical comparatively. It's a bit more towering over the flat platform that it's sitting on. And the Parthenon was the crown jewel of the Acropolis, the high city of Athens, which is up on a high rocky hill looking at the landscape all around it. So rather than being sort of nestled almost modestly into the landscape, like Hatshepsut's temple, it really is perched above it. It's more imposing. It's more towering. And the plan is not linear. So if we look back at Hatshepsut's temple, this is a linear plan, right? It you, you you start out from the front and you go to up to the back and the most sacred space is in the back, right? This is straightforward linear. The Parthenon is actually a central plan. Even though it's it's not round, it's rectangular, it's actually a central plan. The colonnades run all the way around all sides of the building. So you, people are drawn in, right? From all sides, they come into the building and the sacred space, the inner uh, sanctum with the temple god figure is in the middle, right? So it, it has a central focal point. This is a recreation of roughly what the Parthenon might have looked like when it was complete, which was built in Nashville, Tennessee. And I've seen it myself. So for one thing, it was actually quite colorful. And this probably even underplays how much color, how much poly dazzling color there was all over the ornamentation of the Parthenon. And you can see from this view too a bit of how it's very carefully proportioned, right? They they were the builders were extremely meticulous about making this building look balanced, right? Tall, grand, but not overly imposing, not top heavy, 
right? It has just this slightly peaked entablature, but nothing that looks precarious. It has delicately placed ornaments fitted into the geometry of the building. And if you look up close, well, for one thing, if you look at the height of the building from the base up to the peak of the entablature and compare that against the width of the building, you get the golden ratio, which is something that I can't totally explain. It's a ratio of 1.613. And it's a it's a rectangle that can be repeated and subdivided in repeated ways while maintaining that same ratio. So it tends to look sort of balanced, elegant, stable. And if we look up close at the ornaments, the same ratio repeats over again, right? So these, these little panels are called triglyphs and metopes. And if you go from one triglyph to the next and draw a rectangle from th the bottom of the frieze to the top, you get the golden ratio. Then again, you can see the same rectangle shape. Whoop, you see the same rectangle shape repeated sideways, right? The square metope plus the rectangular triglyph, that's a golden ratio. Then if you look at the triglyph itself alone, that's a golden ratio. So what you get is this same basic, simple repeating shape interlocking with itself over and over again, like a fractal from the large scale down to the small scale. And it gives the building overall this sense of being harmonically, organically unified, right? It doesn't look jumbled, it looks harmonized and balanced. And this is sort of the great, you know, highest expression of the Greek building style. And if you look at the layout, you have, as I said, colonnades all the way around all sides, right? Now, that being said, if you actually look in, there's only two gateways into, right? There's one gateway at one end to get into the bigger chamber, which they call the naos, and another into the sort of storeroom called the sekos. But if you go into the naos, there's another smaller colonnade inside, almost like repeating the same design inside out, inside the naos. And then your occult figure is right in the middle, right? So it's actually a central focal point. We don't know for certain exactly what the inner chamber of the Parthenon really looks like, but this is one reconstru possible reconstruction. It seems to be disputed whether or not the roof of the Parthenon had a skylight or not. It may not have, in which case it would have been quite dim. It might have been torch lit, candle lit, and you would go in, you would see again another colonnade, and then the platform and a gold leaf covered statue of the goddess Athena. Right, So everything sort of faces and draws the eye inward into that central focal point. Okay, so I'm just going to check. All right. Stand, woo, okay. Uh, love the opening theme. Feel free to ask any questions. Okay, so I don't see any questions yet unless I'm missing something. I'm interested to understand how mono versus polytheism influenced, if it did, the choices of these varied geometries. You know, that's a really good question. My my instinctual response is surprisingly little. You actually see a lot of the same ideas and layouts repeated and just adapted from polytheistic religions into Christianity. Is there a mythical reason for the dimness? I really can't say. We really, we really don't know because it there may have been a skylight in there to let in more sunlight. That seems to be what some architectural historians think, but we don't know. And if if it was very dim, it makes a lot of sense because this statue was covered in gold and gold will shine forth in the darkness with even just very dim light. So it, it, it would have been it would have made a lot of sense that way. But we I think we just don't know for sure what this interior sanctum looked like. Okay, so having said this much about the Egyptian, the evolution from Egyptian to Greek. Let's go on now to how did all of this play into the Roman era? So the Romans were the great masters of curving lines, as I'll talk about. They, they celebrated and experimented with curves of all kinds. But their monumental building really began with an odd, you could say even awkward blending of Greek with Etruscan. So they were very much aware of Greece. There were Greek colonies in southern Italy. This is a largely intact Greek temple at Paestum in southern Italy. And you can see it's on the same basic plan, right? The, the pillars are a bit fatter and kind of clumsier looking, 
but it's it's the same plan with the colonnade running all the way around the building. This is a reconstruction of an Etruscan temple, the Etruscan temple of Minerva at Veii in what's now Tuscany. So the Etruscans were a long, long lasting ancient civilization with its own history and art and design that the Romans were really more familiar with. This was what was closer to home for them. And they, when they built their early ancient homes, temples, shrines, it was basically on Etruscan plans. And the Etruscans were also aware of the Greeks and maybe took some inspiration from them. But their idea of a temple was completely different and the layout was totally different. So the Greek temple is central plan. You view it and approach it from all sides. The Etruscan is linear, right? It's more like the Egyptian in this way. You approach it from the front. There's one single stairway going up into the porch, and then you enter the gateway. You go through the sanctum, and the cult figure is in the back, right? So it's more like the Temple of Hatshepsut. You approach from front to back and, and enter more sacred space as you go. So the Romans, when they built their grand temples during their their heyday, they did something that's sort of typical. They basically took the Etruscan plan, which they knew and understood, and they dressed it up in Greek clothing. So let me show you what I mean. So this is a very intact surviving Roman temple called the Maison Carré, which just means the square house in Nîmes, France, which is a very old Roman colony in southern France. And you can see the basic layout here is Etruscan, right? You approach from the front, there's one single stairway. You go through this covered front portico. You enter through the gate into the what the Romans called the kella, the sort of sacred enclosed chamber, and then the cult figure would be in the back. However, they've dressed it up in Greek ornamentation, right? The entablature on top, the triangular entablature with the, the dental molding, the frieze running all the way along the whole length, and of course, these Corinthian pillars with the Canthus scroll capitals. And notice how they've continued the colonnade all the way around the entire building, as if it was a Greek temple, even though these pillars, these engaged pillars in the back are totally unnecessary, right? They're this is a solid wall. They don't need pillars in there. It's purely decorative, and it's to create this sort of illusion that you're looking at a Greek-style temple. So this, I point this out because this, I think, is very representative of a lot of what the Romans did in like all aspects of life, not just architecture, which is basically take familiar Etruscan practices and then put a Greek veneer over them, right? And this is a typical Roman temple in that way. The Romans also created their homes on largely an Etruscan model, although they were much more grand. The Etruscan home was inward looking, inward facing, and it had an atrium, a sort of uncovered uh, central atrium where they would have sunlight and gather rainwater. And the Romans basically followed that idea and even blew it up bigger so that a, a Roman a home or domus, if it was in the city, it would be called a domus, would have an atrium and also would have an even wider open courtyard surrounded by uh, a, a colonnaded porch, which was called a peristyle. And this is where a lot of the socializing and social gathering would actually happen in the peristyle. And you can see, again, it's almost kind of like a Greek temple flipped um, uh, inside out, right? You have this full courtyard in the round with colonnade all around it. And so the Romans put a lot of um, resource and labor and attention into their homes and into having these beautiful, intimate, inward-looking homes. Now, the last really important legacy that the Romans picked up from the Etruscans was the arch. So the Greeks did hardly ever used arches, and they didn't really have they didn't develop the sort of geometry and mathematics that was needed to make really big, strong archways, and neither did the Egyptians. But the Etruscans did, and this is a surviving uh, arched gateway in the walls of the town of Volterra in Tuscany, dating to about 300 BC. So the Romans picked up arches and the, the mathematics behind them from the Etruscans, and they ran with it 
like no one else ever had before in the world. And this becomes the great hallmark of Roman architecture. So the Romans, for one thing, they build archways just as monuments to celebrate important people, events, emperors, generals. This on the left is the Arch of Augustus, which was an early triumphal arch, right? Just kind of showing off their, their power and their, their wealth. Uh, there are arches like the Arch of Titus and the Arch of Septimius Severus on the Forum. And they also used arcades, right? Repeating chains of arches for decoration and also for practical purposes, right? So this is a massive uh, aqueduct crossing over the Gard River in France called the Pont du Gard. And it, you can see it has these three tiers of arches designed to distribute and carry weight and keep this water channel course perfectly even as it crosses over this deep river valley. So this sort of use of arches became fundamental really to the Roman infrastructure and to their ability to feed and support their enormous cities. And they also used arcades to, you could say, in a sense, round out massive public buildings and to give them a look of welcoming and openness, right, rather than looking just like imposing edifices. So this is the theater of Marcellus on the left, and that is the Flavian Amphitheater, more popularly known as the Colosseum on the right. And these are both places of public gathering. They've put in arcades on the ground floor to allow open, free movement of the crowds in and out. And then they repeat the arcades on higher stories above that. And rather than just having big, heavy, imposing piers, they've added in these little slender, engaged pillars. Again, like on the temple, they add in engaged pillars to make it look more light and open and decorative. And what's more, this repeating half-circle arch through the arcades then echoes the gently curving form of the building itself. So again, you get this sort of fractal effect, whereas on the Parthenon, you have this sort of fractal of larger and smaller rectangles that repeat the same form in these grand Roman public buildings, you have repeating curves, right? One building on top of another. The Romans also built domes. So domes were very rare in the world and nobody mastered domes like the Romans did. They understood the geometry of how to distribute weight to make a perfectly stable dome. They also used concrete, which could fuse together literally and form a solid dome in a way that you couldn't do with stones stacked together. And it seems the earliest domes were in bathhouses. So these are examples here. This is the cold water chamber in the bathhouse at Baiae, which was a Roman resort town in southern Italy. And you can see it's remarkably strong and stable. It's still standing while most of the stone building around it has collapsed or crumbled away. And this is the interior with the oculus letting in light and air. And this had the advantage of capturing steam and vapors from the baths in this domed structure. So bathhouse domes then became the template firstly for rotundas in buildings like palaces. So this is the rotunda at the heart of Nero's so-called golden house or Domus Aurea. And you can see it has this simple dome, oculus in the center, and then different galleries and hallways leading off from this rotunda in the various directions with the rotunda right here at the heart. And the rotunda in the Domus Aurea, of course, formed a kind of prototype, a forerunner for the great masterpiece of Roman architecture, which is, of course, the Pantheon. So the Pantheon was built in 125 AD, not only sponsored by, but designed by the Emperor Hadrian. And you can see it's a totally audacious new kind of monumental building. It is built around a circular drum with an entrance portico in front and a concrete dome on top. The dome of the Pantheon is a single solid block of poured concrete, which has held together with almost no flaws or cracks for almost 2000 years, something that could never happen with modern concrete. Now, part of the great genius of the Pantheon is that this is what it looks like when you approach it from the piazza in front, or at that time it would have been the Campus Martius or the Field of Mars. Uh, 
of fields on the northern outskirts of the city. And when you approach it this way, it can look almost like a normal, traditional Etruscan style temple, right? You're approaching this simple entablatured portico with a colonnade. You're going to walk in through the gateway and into the Kella and approach the figure of a god at the back, right? That's what you would expect in a normal Etruscan style temple. It's only when you walk through the entrance gate that you enter into this. The space opens up around you into this massive, soaring, open rotunda with niches for the figures of different gods all around, right? Whereas, whereas a linear plan is appropriate for when you're going to go give offerings to one god, the pantheon is on this grand central plan where you can look around and approach whichever god or gods you want. And you can see in here the coffered inner surface of the dome. And as I said, it's a single solid piece of concrete poured in place. How and why has it survived this well? Well, just a little engineering. Roman concrete is much stronger than any concrete that we've created in modern times. For hundreds of years, the recipe and formula for Roman concrete has been lost, and chemists have been working for decades to try to analyze and rediscover what it was. One important uh, ingredient that's been known for a while is volcanic ash, this super fine ash. Another one that was just recently determined, I think a few months ago, is that it also includes undissolved clumps of lime powder. So lime powder is a highly reactive alkaline mineral. It's normal to use that in concrete, but the Romans, it seems, included undissolved clumps of it and the idea was that if a crack did form in a concrete structure from, from ice or seismic activity or just weight and wear, water would get into the crack. It would react with those clumps of lime, foam, and crystallize, and thus fill in the crack. So Roman concrete is self-healing. And that's part of why we can still see things like this magnificent dome on the Pantheon. So after the Pantheon, as you go through the 200s, 300s AD, there is a trend towards more and more complex uh, sort of interlocking monumental structures, including palaces and more and more massive bathhouses. And the, the most famous one is the Baths of Caracalla, built in Rome in 216. And you can see this is an extremely complex design with different archways, vaulted tunnels, uh, colonnades, arcades, all interlocking in this almost kind of labyrinthine complex. And this more and more, it seems, becomes the, the Roman style in these later years in the 200s and 300s. And in a way, you could say this culminates with the sort of final Roman building idea, which is the basilica. So basilicas, the Roman basilicas are not necessarily the what we would consider the most beautiful or dazzling buildings, right? They're not celebrated like the, the Pantheon or the Colosseum. But they were important because Rome was at this time becoming a more monarchical and authoritarian society where you had sort of general emperors who ruled as dictators. And the basilica is basically an audience chamber. It's, it's a massive building that usually has a, a central, large, uh, vaulted hall, and then adjoining halls on either side of it as well. And they're interconnected by archways, so they form a sort of continuous chamber. And this is where people would go to gather. You might hold a market, but you also would hear decrees, pronouncements, judgments being announced by an authority figure like the emperor or general. And if you look into the central hall of the Basilica of Maxentius, which is on the forum and built in the early 300s, you see a sort of recessed alcove in the very back. That's called the apse. And you could have a throne or a podium set into the apse, and it was built to be acoustic, right? It would, it would help project the voice of this authority figure out through the basilica. And this is, you could say, sort of the culmination of the evolution of Roman architecture before you then get the beginning of Christian architecture. So the basilica is important because it becomes one of the inspirations and templates for early Christian building.
But before I get into that, I'll check again um, on those arches they were taking from the Romans. Rome in the early modern period would build them every other day. I see Florence did not learn about that concrete. Yeah, self-healing concrete. You crack it and it and it fills itself in. It's amazing. <laughs> yeah. So the, the 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 multiple uses of arches and of curves and vaults of all kinds. That is the great hallmark of Roman design. So we talked about the Basilica of Maxentius and the apse. Now it seems this is one of the inspirations then for early Christian architecture. So Maxentius was overthrown by a rival general named Constantine who defeated him at the Battle of Milvian Bridge. And Constantine later attributed his victory over Maxentius to the support of the Christian God. And he became the first emperor to openly embrace Christianity, and he sponsored and encouraged massive public building of Christian churches. And this was revolutionary. This is where Christianity sort of came out of the closet, you could say. It, was, it had been a private religion, and Christians had met for worship, most often in private homes, especially in the Perry style, in that colonnaded courtyard, also in barracks, warehouses, you know, where, wherever they could meet catacombs underground. Well, now with Constantine, suddenly money, energy, power is being put into building buildings specifically for Christian worship. And the basic design that they first use is what we call the basilica design. So this is an early example. This is the Church of the Nativity in uh, in Bethlehem, in Palestine. And you can see it has a basic simple form, right? It's forward facing with a central hall like the Basilica of Maxentius. And then it has smaller side aisles with lower ceilings on either side, simply set off by colonnades. And at the back, this is a big you know, altarpiece, probably from the Middle Ages. But behind it, you can see this arc, that's the apse set into the back. So this concept of it is like the Basilica of Maxentius, although the appearance is very different. This is another very early Basilica church, which still stands at uh, Santa Maria in Trastevere, which is in Rome. It's the Western neighborhood of Rome. And if you look at the layout of Santa Maria in Trastevere, it's complicated because over the years, things have been glommed onto it. They've added on side chapels, sacristies, all this sort of mishmash. But underneath that, you can still see the basic outline of the original basilica, and it's very simple. There's a front entranceway, a central hall called the nave. It's so like the Greek naos, the central hall with the high ceiling in a basilica is called the nave, which means the ship. So it's like, you can imagine, it's like the hull of a ship turned upside down. And then there are side aisles with lower ceilings offset by a simple colonnade. This is what it looks like from the front. This is probably a Renaissance era portico in the front, right? With the sort of covered porch. But then this is the original basilica, right? Central nave with the high elevated ceiling and the lower side aisles on the sides. This is a Romanesque era campanile, right? But the original building is just, you can see here. Okay, another great, more intact example that hasn't been changed as much is Santa Sabina, which is on the Aventine Hill in Rome, which was built in the early 400s. And again, you see the same simple basic outline of the basilica, forward facing, looking into the apse, right? And for, for a Christian basilica, this is where the priest or bishop would be seated. He would preach the word, he might lead a prayer, and he would perform the the Eucharistic Mass, right? So you would see the the miracle of the sacrament of the Eucharist, per, Eucharist performed here in the apse. And again, it's acoustic so that the sound will project out into the whole hall. This is what Santa Sabina looks like inside, right? Simple, airy, <clears throat> airy, lofty. The advantage of having this high elevated central hall with the high ceiling is it's higher than the side aisles, so you get this strip of space up here where you can put in windows. And these are simple arched windows with grill work, and this is called the clear story. Right? So that lets in light and air. You have this simple open apse. 
The idea is that everyone can easily see and hear one another. It's a gathering place. It's reminiscent, for one thing, of the peristyle courtyard, where probably most early Christian worship in Rome actually happened. It also is, again, kind of like a Greek temple flipped inside, right? And the, the beauty, the light, the embellishment is all being drawn into the interior. The exterior is pretty plain, right? You look at you look at the exterior of Santa Sabina, it's plain and functional. Everything is about the intimacy of this interior space. This fresco is later, right? That's probably Renaissance era. So at the time, at the time this was built, it would have been even more plain and understated. In later centuries, as we go into the 600s, 700s, 800s, the styles shifted. They were influenced a great deal by the Byzantines, as I'll talk about later. And it became fashionable to put in mosaics, especially in and around the apse. So these are brightly shining glass mosaics. This is an example here in Santa Polinare in Ravenna, which is a city in Italy that was closely connected to the Byzantine Empire. And this is Santa Maria in Trastevere, right? So if you go inside the building, that's what the, the apse looks like, right? It's very dazzling, very rich, but that was all added in later. That's not what it would have looked like when it was built. So these are all examples of this basic template that we see over and over again, all over the early Christian world is this basilica form. Now, meanwhile, at the same time, there was a competing form and model of church, which is round, right? With a central plan looking inward. So I mentioned before, this is an early round church, the Church of the Holy Sepulchre in Jerusalem. This, again, we don't know really what it looked like originally when it was built, but from the beginning, it had, it did have a round plan with a rotunda and this big open soaring space under the dome. And it seems that this is what Constantine really liked. He really preferred the sort of drama of the round church, and he sponsored the building of the original Church of the Holy Sepulchre. Another really dramatic example of a round church in the West is San Vitale in Ravenna, which was built in the 520s. So we think of Ravenna as a place for Byzantine art and design, right? But actually, a lot of that artwork was first built under the rule of the Ostrogoths, especially the Ostrogothic King Theodoric. And he sponsored the building of San Vitale, which you can see is a very interesting kind of odd design, right? So there's an entrance portico here. You would enter in into either of these gateways into a round space, right? The outer wall is octagonal. And then there's a circle of piers within that. So you have this sort of central space where you can look up into the dome and outward. Almost like in a basilica, you could look to, to the side and see those side aisles, right, offset by pillars. Well, in San Vitale, it wraps around into a circle. But also at the same time, when you worship, you're supposed to face forward and look into the apse. So it's a weird sort of combination. And it's very beautiful. This is looking up into that, into the elevated gallery running around the rotunda. And this is looking up into the dome of San Vitale. Again, some of these decorations like this Greek meander might be very old, but a lot of these frescoes are clearly later, probably Renaissance era. But it's a very dramatic, dazzling space, right? Again, with a central design. This is a view that I stole of some worshipers seeing a worship service being held over here in the apse. And we're looking from the point of view of this side gallery, right? And this shows you, again, the beauty, the openness, the grandeur of this space, but at the same time, also the awkwardness. So notice how where we're standing, we can't see in the apse. Our view is blocked. And this is a problem with San Vitale, with a round church. It's like, okay, we have these wasted spaces around here where you can't really see into the apse, and it's it's sort of awkward, right? There's there's it is Are you supposed to be facing inward or forward? And... Even this, this central rotunda, it's like, okay, it's wonderful that you can see up into the dome, but you're supposed to be looking forward. So it's sort of disaligned, right? And it's awkward. And there were difficult trade-offs, right? There were things to love about the round church and things that were better or more practical about the basilica church. And the big question became, is there some way to combine them? 
is there some way to have your cake and eat it too and have a basilica that at the same time also has a grand open rotunda and dome over it. So this became sort of the puzzle in the 500s. But before I talk about who solved the puzzle, I'll check again, see if in the in the chat. I thought I should have corrected, but didn't. Okay, self healing properties why it lasted. The dead space is where babies go when they cry at mass. <laughs> you try to get them out of the way, right? It can be a way to to hide people, but with the acoustics of a church like San Vitale, you'd probably still hear the noise. So this question of how do we have our cake and eat it too? You could say how do we square the circle? This became the puzzle that the Byzantines set out to solve. Okay, so the Byzantines, they are the Eastern Roman Empire. So as the empire split in the 400s, the, the Western Empire collapsed. Italy was taken over by the Ostrogothic Kingdom. Meanwhile, the empire persisted in the East with its capital at Constantinople. It became a Greek-speaking Christian empire. That's what we call the Byzantine Empire. And it was Byzantine builders who figured out ways to have both, right? To have a domed basilica with a forward-facing linear plan, but at the same time, an inward-facing central rotunda. So how did that happen? Well, the first thing they had to, the, the first tool they had to adopt to make this work was squinching, okay? So what does that mean? Well, squinching is a method you can use in order to put a round dome on top of a square-based chamber. So what you do is say, this is an example of a square-based chamber like you see in all kinds of buildings, right? And you can have archways leading out to galleries or whatever you want, but it's a square, right? If you try to put a round dome directly on top of that, it's not gonna work, right? The, the dome's gonna push out at the sides, it's all gonna collapse, right? It's putting a square peg on a round hole. But what you can do is go into the upper interior corner of the chamber and add in a crossbar or a little arch to support some weight. And by doing that, what you've done is you've sort of pinched in the corners so that now you have an octagon. And if your chamber is not too big, like this one in a basilica in Armenia, you add in your squinches in the corner, you now have an octagon form. And that can be good enough that you can then sort of finesse and put a dome on top of that, and it will be stable enough to, to stand up. If you have a really big dome, if you're trying to build something massive, you might need to even squinch in even more. You might go into the corners of your octagon and even squinch those in so that then you have a 16-sided form, and maybe that then is close enough to a circle that you can then build a circular drum and a dome on top. So this method was, it seems, invented in the Persian Empire. And this is the oldest known example that's ever been found. It's in the great audience chamber of the Palace of Ardashir, built in Persia in AD 224. So you can see there's a square-based audience receiving room. Then they put squinches in the corners, sort of finagle it into roughly a circle, and then build the dome on top. And here's an example of one of those squinches. They built, they built an arch on top of the upper corner. And, you know, that's good enough. That'll work. So this is probably the earliest example that's ever been found of a squinch. Okay, here are more examples. It, it's become very common in Islamic architecture, right? There are many Middle Eastern and Islamic buildings with domes on top of square-based buildings. This is an example where they sort of work it and sculpt it into a decorative shape. It almost looks like it's part of the decorative scheme. It points upward into the dome. And you can see here too, this is right, this is a square-based chamber. They've put in this squinch, it's now an octagon, and then they add in more squinches onto those corners. So now it's become a hexadecagon, right? And then on top of that, they build a nice circular drum and then the dome. So squinches are often very visible and very flamboyant in Islamic buildings, right? In European buildings, the method that developed was a bit different. So here, this is a modern, church in New York City that is in the Byzantine style, right? Imitating a Byzantine church. And what you have is uh, square-based chambers uh, with arches on top, and then they squinch in the corners, but they cover over the squinches. Rather than leaving them visible, they extend a gentle curve 
down from the dome, right down over the squinch. So it almost looks like it's just organically emerging from the pillars, right? And in this case, it's it extends down to the top of the corner pillars. So this is called a pendentive. Basically what you see here, this, this gray area with this water pattern, that's the pendentive. In some buildings, it extends all the way down to the floor. And it looks as if the dome is just emerging and leaping all the way up from the ground to the sky. But those are pendentives. That's more of the Western custom. This is more of the Islamic custom. Okay. Now, you may be thinking, this doesn't quite add up, right? There's something missing. Because squinching allows you to put a dome on top of a square. But basilicas aren't square. They're long, oblong rectangles, especially the central elevated nave with its high ceiling, right? It's a long rectangle. So squinching is not enough. You have to somehow break the nave up into smaller square pieces and then put a dome on top of that. So the first attempt to do that was the Basilica of St. Irene in Constantinople, built under the sponsorship of the Emperor Justinian, who was a very long reigning successful emperor who presided over a sort of brief golden period of the Byzantine Empire. And so with St. Irene, they built a pretty standard looking basilica, right? With your central nave, your apse, your entrance portico. But then in order to be able to dome it, they built a big, heavy, thick central archway that cuts right across the nave. And it splits the nave into two smaller pieces. So one is almost kind of square. It's like rectangular. So they built a sort of partial low dome over that one. And then back further back towards the apse, they now have a square, right? They squinch in the corners and they build a nice big high dome. So this was one way to get a dome on top of a basilica. But as you can see, there are certain disadvantages, right? Instead of having a nice open sweep in the nave, it's now disrupted by this big heavy arch splitting the nave. And the dome that they build is not really that big and wide and open. It's really only covering over one sort of back part of the nave. So Justinian was not totally satisfied with this solution in St. Irene. And this is the outside of the St. Irene Basilica. So you can see, again, the outside is quite utilitarian, un almost unfinished. And you have these two domes, right? So you'd enter in the portico over here. You'd walk under the first low dome, then under the bigger, higher dome, and then the apse is in the back. But it, you know, it looks a little jumbled. It's kind of hard to tell which way is this church supposed to be oriented. It has these kind of different elements sticking out. It doesn't look so elegant. So Justinian was not satisfied. So he brought in more builders from Eastern, the Eastern Empire, where people were very familiar with Persian design and the squinching method. And those builders came up with the great masterpiece of Byzantine architecture, which is the Basilica of Santa Sophia, which was completed just a few years later in 537. So this is the basic original layout of Santa Sophia. And you can see you've got a simple square in entrance portico, you would come in and then this is the nave, right? With the big elevated uh, roof. And notice how they've sort of drawn the piers in instead of just having straight colonnades running along the sides. Instead, they've drawn these piers in and then pushed these out a bit. So you end up with this sort of oblong oval shape. So this is the first way that they are creating a sort of compromise where you have, you still have a forward-facing linear design leading your eye towards the apse, but you also have this sort of bowed out rounded design around a central focal point. So there again, this is how they're kind of having their cake and eating it too. Now, how do they get the dome on top? Well, they just take the two ends of the nave and cut them off, right? So they build in high sort of soaring arches over the two ends of the nave. So they cut off this part and they build a half dome facing inward here, and they build a half dome facing inward over here. And then you're left with a square in the center, and then you squinch in the corners and you build your dome. And you have a nice big wide dome dominating the center of the building.
So this is what it looks like from the outside, right? It was called Santa Sofia. It was a Christian basilica. Centuries later, after the Ottoman Turks took over, it was rededicated as a mosque, and it's now known as Hagia Sophia. And they added on these minarets on the corners. But the basic footprint of the Christian basilica is still there and is unchanged. And you can see you would enter in the porticos over here. You would enter in a vestibule under this half dome. Then there's a big rotunda with this huge soaring 130 foot wide dome, and then another half dome, and then the apse in the back, right? So it's still oriented this way. And again, you know, this one maybe is a little more elegantly finished, but it can look really jumbled, right? From the outside, you can't really tell what part is what here, which way are you supposed to be facing, where's the entrance way. But what does it look like inside, right? The point was the interior. So what do you see inside? There you go. So this is what it looks like from the elevated gallery in the vestibule, looking inwards from the east towards, sorry, from the west towards the east. So this is the huge open nave basilica floor. There are side aisles down over here. These are the arches supporting the rotunda. You have a half dome over our heads here. Then the big dome with the circle of windows around the base. Then another half dome at the east end, and then the apse set into the very end. And this is where the Eucharist and other sacraments would be performed in the apse. So they're managing to sort of have their cake and eat it too, right? It's forward facing, but at the same time, focused around this huge, soaring, bright, airy space at the center. This is another view just on the floor of the nave, looking forward and upward, right? You have your half dome, your apse, and then even these little ornamental additional half domes around the side, and then the big dome on top. And most of the decoration and ornamentation you see here is basically original to the, the Byzantine Basilica, right? Those are Greek style Christian ornamentations. The Ottoman Turks just added in these big wood medallions with Quranic verses to mark it as a, a mosque. Okay, and this is a mosaic in the vestibule by the entranceway, which was added in probably several hundred years later when these mosaics really came into fashion. And you see St. Mary, right, seated with the Christ child. And then this is the Emperor Constantine. You can see his name, Constantinos presenting the city of Constantinople as an offering to St. Mary. And then on the left, we see Justinianos or Justinian presenting the basilica itself as an offering to St. Mary. And this, this basilica became the great hallmark of Byzantine architecture that was imitated and, and echoed over and over again all over the empire and also in other places as well beyond the Byzantine empire. And in these later centuries, also the style of Byzantine church began to change. So whereas Santa Sophia is, is in a way, it's a quintessential basilica with the forward facing uh, nave and the side aisles. Over time, the design and the tastes started to change in the early 800s and then in the 900s. The exteriors started to be more finished, more polished. You can see there's more harmony, the echoing and alignment of windows and archways. And in the interior, instead of having a clear linear plan with a nave and side aisles, instead they reduced it down to just four simple pillars, which effectively create a cross shape. So these become the first cross-based church designs. So, and, and this is what we call a Greek cross, right? It's not what we think of as a crucifix. It's a cross with four equal uh, arms reaching out. And what did they do then with this cross shape? This is what they did. So this is the same church, the Miralayon church. So they take the, the arms and they vault each one, and then they use those vaults to support a central dome. So this is another way of, again, sort of having your cake and eating it too, right? Having a linear plan facing forward towards the apse, but at the same time, having a central dome that forms a central focal point. So there are sort of two focuses. And this basic form with the Greek cross was then adopted and repeated and elaborated on 
in other places beyond the Byzantine Empire. So this is a great example of a sort of whimsical, audacious elaboration on the Byzantine plan. So this is St. Mark's Basilica in Venice, which was another port city like Ravenna that had close trade and diplomatic links with Byzantium. And it's, you know, there's all kinds of styles jumbled together here. There's splashes of Romanesque and Gothic. But if you look at the floor plan, you can see that the basic original outline is just a simple Greek cross. And what they did is not only did they put a dome over the crossing in the middle, like the Byzantine style, they also added on more domes on each of the arms. So now you have five domes all kind of competing or speaking to one another. And on the inside, it looks like this, right? It's elaborate mosaics, basically in the Byzantine style, creating a sort of shining, dazzling, golden space. Another example of how the Byzantine style spread and was elaborated is in the East. So we have Venice sort of elaborating on the Byzantine in the West. Then you have the new uh, Slavic kingdoms in Eastern Europe that are emerging. And as they embrace Christianity, they also pick up and imitate and elaborate on the Byzantine style. So the early church buildings in Eastern Europe were wood, and they've all collapsed. And actually, the first large monumental stone church called the Church of the Tithes is also gone. But we have a clue of what it looks like. So this is a coin minted by the Kiev Rus, the sort of early Christian Russian kingdom, basically in what's now Ukraine. And this was minted by the first Christian king named Volodymyr. And you see him here holding a model of what was called the Church of the Tithes, the sort of first grand stone Christian church in Eastern Europe. And you can see here, again, it appears to be on a Greek cross plan. And there are several domes right, on each part of the church. And then this is what seems to then have evolved and developed into what we think of as the signature Eastern European style of elaborate soaring domes, not only half spheres or hemispheres, but bowing out into the onion shape and really creating drama, visual drama with multiple domes. Okay, let me see if we've got um, Hi, Sophia looks like a university. <laughs> yeah, it's rather, it's rather jumbled. Yeah, and that's an important thing to bear in mind. That's good to point out that um, the, the, the Byzantines didn't put that much care into the polish of the exterior, right? At least not early on, not in the early Byzantine style. Later, they would put more kind of finesse into the exterior look of the church, but their focus was on the interior. And the idea that the exterior should look grand, uh, dignified, polished, that is more of a Western idea. Okay. How can you tell it's a Greek? Well, that's true. We really can't. Uh, we're assuming. But the, the, um, that, that was the common model. Okay. So, so this, is, this is the basic Byzantine idea that then spread and exploded out into other places. But it didn't really penetrate all the way west beyond Italy. Rather, as you go further west into France, Spain, Britain, the, the story is much more muddled and mysterious. And there are very few surviving buildings from the early Middle Ages in the west. Okay. So through the 400s, 500s, 600s, and even the 700s, it was very rare to build any substantial buildings out of stone in the West. It was a period of relative fragmentation, very little long distance trade, uh, comparative instability. People did build grand buildings like grand meeting halls, but they were timber. They were timber and earthwork and they don't survive. And all we can really do is sort of guess what they might have looked like based on the excavated post holes. But little by little, some tradition of stone building did re-emerge. And there are a few very early medieval surviving stone buildings from the West. They are mostly in the British Isles, where there was a lot of availability of stone and quarries. <clears throat> 
So this is the interior of St. Martin's Church in Canterbury, which was built sometime in the 500s. It was already being used as a church by 597. And what you have really is like very simple, very understated. It's like a basilica with no side aisles, right? So it's just a simple rectilinear chamber uh, built of stone, stone arched windows. What we see back in here is a chancel that was added on later. That was not original. Probably there was just a simple apse, right? So just a simple stone chamber with an apse and the roof is still wood frame, right? Not stone. So it, it's it's crude, right? But it was a place, it, it, it had a certain atmosphere, right? It's quiet, it's contemplative, and it would have had probably dim light just let in by the windows with shutters or cloth over them. And they were really places of contemplation. That was more of the style, it seems, in the British Isles. This is another, this is really the next surviving church building from about 100 years later. So if you look at St. Paul's Church at Jarrow, Jarrow was a huge monastery complex in northeastern England in what was called in the, the Kingdom of Northumbria. And there's a stone church attached to it. And most of it is later, is sort of Romanesque and Gothic era. But just the chancel, so the back chamber where the altar table would be, that it seems was the original church. It was just a very simple one-room stone structure. You can see here the remnants of what would have been the tiny windows dating back to the Anglo-Saxon period. This is what it looks like from the inside facing back towards the newer parts of the church, you know, newer comparatively speaking. And you can see very plain, almost crude stone walls, a very simple, dignified, open archway. This window is later. That would have been knocked in later. You would have had just rows of very small niche-like windows along the walls. And it would have had good acoustics for chant and, and music. It probably would have been quite cold and drafty. And it would have been quite dim. right? And this, it seems, is what these really early stone buildings were like. But eventually, bit by bit, new uh, customs and practices of stone building developed and 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 stone architecture revived. So this is a, an overhead view of Skellig Michael, which is a monastery complex of the Irish Celtic Church, which is on a rocky, isolated island on the western coast of Ireland. And it might look familiar to some people. Some scenes of Star Wars, the latest Star Wars movie, I think, were, were filmed here with like Luke Skywalker and such, like living out there as a monk. So this is built, it looks quite crude, right? Compared to the sort of Roman and Byzantine buildings we've been looking at, it looks very crude. But it was a great leap forward for that time because it's a return to dome building in stone. Right. So this is their they're sort of reviving and reinventing this whole practice of building domed buildings and chambers. And it probably just happened because monks were living in this isolated spot on this island and there are no trees. So they couldn't build with timber. There's not even enough dirt, it looks like, to build earthworks. So they built out of stone. Right. And this is part of how bit by bit techniques were discovered or rediscovered. Now, the dramatic leap forward that really uh, revived and, and advanced building in Western Europe, in the Latin West, was the Carolingian Empire, right? So the Frankish Empire under Charlemagne's dynasty, and particularly Charlemagne himself. So Charlemagne was a warrior and a general. He didn't, he was barely literate, it seems. He hardly knew anything about art or history or culture, but he saw it as important and as part of the legitimacy and dignity of his reign. And he brought together artists, scholars of all kinds at his royal courts, particularly at Aachen. And he, he sponsored the revival of literature and art and building. And he also sponsored and supported big monasteries. So monasteries become part of Carolingian civilization, and they also become centers of great building in a way that just had never been seen 
since the Roman era or in some places like in northern Germany had never been seen before at all. So this is the surviving gatehouse. There aren't many surviving Carolingian buildings, but we can extrapolate some things about them based on the few surviving specimens. And this is the gatehouse from the Abbey of Lorsch in Germany. And this is a really remarkable piece of work because it's stone and brick and covered in this sort of decorative tile pattern, something that we have never seen before on earlier buildings. It seems to just come out of nowhere. And it combines these odd elements, like it has these sort of Roman-like looking uh, arches and these engaged pillars, right? Could be a Roman building. But then it has this polychrome tile decoration. And then on the upper story, it has this weird kind of arcade with these angular straight lines, which again, don't look like anything you'd see in a Roman building. And I think I would wager that those are mimicking the look of a timber frame building. So you're seeing the sort of motifs and images from those older early medieval timber buildings then being sort of adapted and recreated in stone and brick. And finally, you see this extremely high pitched roof, which is good for, you know, a snowy climate. But it also is something totally new and different that probably, again, is mimicking the timber halls that people would have seen in Northern Europe, but all now put into stone and brick. So this is a really great example of, of surviving intact exterior decoration of a Carolingian building. As for designs and foundations, the Carolingians built grand churches on a grand scale like the basilicas but with much more strange and complex plans. So this is the Abbey Church, again, attached to a, a monastery at Centula, built in 802. The building does not survive, but the foundations do. And we can see there's a sort of middle section of the church that's like a normal basilica. Looks familiar, right? Central nave, colonnade, side aisles. But then the entranceway now has this massive new wing called a Westworks with elevated galleries, probably choir stalls, side shrines and chapels, then another crossbar called the transept. So now we're seeing the very beginnings of a Latin cross-shaped church. So there's a transept, again, with side gates and, and windows. And this is the chancel. So now instead of just having the apse, you now have this extended block in front of the apse where you could have an altar table, uh, a, an elevated altar, uh, artwork, any number of things, choir. And so now it, this is a complicated design with all these sort of side nooks and crannies. And we have these spiral staircases, which it seems led up into towers and spires. So now this is a rough reconstruction of what the church might have looked like based on later drawings from the Middle Ages. So you can see it's highly complex. It looks almost like a whole town or palace complex unto itself, and it has these dramatic upward-pointing vertical elements, right? It's now reaching and thrusting upward in a way that the old basilicas never did. So this is really the first distinctively Western European architectural style. And again, it's very mysterious. We don't know a lot about it, but it clearly was revolutionary. And the great masterpiece of Carolingian building, of course, was Charlemagne's Palatine Chapel, or the, the, the palace chapel at his palace at Aachen, which was completed in 805. So this is a rough cross section. You can see it's multi-layered, multi-tiered, different elements being hooked and woven together and culminating with a dome. It still stands, right? So most of Charlemagne's buildings are gone and most of the palace complex that this was attached to is gone. But this chapel still stands and the cathedral of Aachen has been sort of built around it. So you can see like these Gothic things springing off from the sides. But this is the original chapel. This dome, also this ribbed dome on top is later. That was added on hundreds of years later. But the inside is intact. And that's what it looks like. So you can see it's dramatically verticalist, soaring upwards into this brightly lit mosaic covered dome with these big arched windows letting in light, these huge soaring pillars, right? So the worshipers would have gathered down here in the sort of central floor in the midst of this huge rotunda, and they would have heard mass 
from the apps, but they would have been able to look up into this rotunda with all of these kind of uh, just complicated, interacting decorative elements. And it's very eclectic. So you can see like the archways, the pillars uh, holding up a little arcade, very Roman. The dome, this octagonal dome with mosaics is very Byzantine. It's clearly inspired a lot by Santa Sophia. And then there are other elements, like you see these arches with the alternating polychrome colors, sort of creating like a radiating pattern. Well, that's inspired by Islamic buildings, like you can see in the Great Mosque of Cordoba from just a few years earlier, this arcade with these radiating red and white stripes of stone and brick. That has now been borrowed and integrated into Charlemagne's chapel. So, so the Palatine Chapel, it, it is grand, it's impressive. It can also come across as a bit jumbled, right? How do these elements fit together? There are these strong vertical lines, but then they're kind of interrupted by these crossbars and arches. Where is this sunburst pointing? Is it pointing at these saint figures? It can look a little confused, right? It's not it's not so polished and unified. This is what the worship space would look like. And again, you have the same sort of issue as at San Vitale, right? You have these worshipers around this central focal point, but what are they looking at? The apse is over here, <laughs> right? So it's sort of looking this way and that way at once. It's a little awkward. And at the same time, there's an added element that you'd be looking and hearing the, the sacraments and the prayers from the apse but probably at the same time, your attention would also be on another niche where Charlemagne's throne is located. So off in one of those side galleries, he had this plain stone platform and a plain stone throne. And that's where he would sit to hear mass and hear worship. So you, again, it's, it's very understated compared to the opulent building around it. But it's the emperor, right? He's sort of first among equals. And this is just the view you'd see standing in the middle looking up into the dome right? Magnificent radiating pattern, the multiple layers, the tiers, the colors, the textures, but it's almost a little confusing to look at, right? So the Carolingian style then carries on, and I'll, I'll, I'll end now by talking about a last building that was built a few decades later in Spain, which was a royal palace outside of Oviedo in the kingdom of Asturias in Spain. And it was built in 842, which is really remarkable because that's the year when Charlemagne's, the Carolingian Empire broke up. And it also was the height of the Viking era. So this was a time when states and empires were really falling apart into disorder and violence. But there was, you could say, a sort of last flowering of Carolingian building here in Spain, which also then seems to have been transitional and pointed the way towards a new style. So this is really a country pleasure palace for a king on a high perch, right? And you can see it's amazingly tall and narrow. It's extremely verticalist, right? There are these tall, slender pillars, these decorative uh, vertical elements running up through the facade towards this peaked roof. And you can see on the entranceway, it's this tall, narrow staircase, and then these tall, narrow, vertical buttresses running along the outside. Everything about it is reaching upward. It is high and airy. It's a perch for a king to look out over his domains. And this porch here is called the Belvedere. And the king could sit out on his throne in the Belvedere and look out over his domains. So this is, in, in many ways, this is a very simple, a very plain, a very understated building. But in very simple, plain, understated ways, it's pointing upwards into the air, into the sky, drawing the eye upwards. And if we go inside through, we can go in through the Belvedere, you see these very tall, narrow doorways with these arched peaks, these engaged pillars, again, reaching and pointing upwards. And then inside we see this, right? We no longer have a pitched roof leaning in. Instead, we have a full barrel vault, right? This open, high, airy ceiling probably would have had beautiful acoustics, echoing sounds. And you have these, again, engaged pillars all along the way, pointing upward, almost no horizontal lines interrupting the verticalism, 
right? Everything seems to be almost lifting up and floating away. And the and it would be very imposing, right? It would be a sort of frightening, imposing space, except that it has these little subtle human scale decorative elements, these little carvings cutting across the pillars, these little geometric designs on the pillar capitals, these little rosettes over the doorways. So there are these little subtle elements that give it a sort of human scale, almost intimate feel at the same time that it is light, it is airy, it is verticalist. And this, it seems, was, although it's not a huge building, this was a critical transitional moment that laid the foundation then for the emergence of a new style that would come later in the late 900s when there was a return to stability, prosperity in the high Middle Ages. And it would lead, it points the way towards the first style of the high Middle Ages, which is the Romanesque. So I'm going to leave that off till another lecture when hopefully I'll pick up with the Romanesque and the Gothic, the styles of the high Middle Ages. But let me see. Are there other questions? How much was Carolingian architecture borrowing from the Byzantines and Al-Andalus? Definitely both a lot. I mean, the 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 it was kind of a blending of the two. And as you can see, in some places, it was a bit of an awkward blending, right? They hadn't really worked out an effective synthesis, but they knew that those were both sources of of beauty and grandeur, right? With the the, the grand rotundas and the bright mosaics of the Byzantine and the fine geometric ornamentation and the, the bowed arcades of the, the, the mosques in Spain. The direction of architecture is pointing. Hatshepsut's temple is pointing west to the land of the dead, the desert, right? Yeah, so it's, it's a mortuary temple, right? It's about communing with the dead. Thank you so much for such an interesting review. Thank you. Thank you for joining. I hope you liked it and that I didn't go on too, too long. Um, yeah, Lorsch Abbey looks like a stereotypical medieval city building. Yeah, so the the medieval towns are extremely verticalist. And there was a practical reason for that because you had to squeeze in in tight spaces within the town walls, right? You needed the safety of the, the fortified town. So you would squeeze what you could into a limited lot. The thing about the Lorsch Abbey Gateway is it didn't really have to be that way. It was soaring and, and tall and verticalist just for aesthetic reasons, right? Okay, beautiful. Thanks so much for doing this. Thank you all so much for joining me. And uh, that's the end. So so Dan can hit the, the outro music. And hopefully I will see you all again soon. <laughs>